So good evening, everybody. I'm Mark East. Uh, Pastor Tim asked me to uh, deliver the word tonight, and uh, I'm delighted to do so. I get as much out of this as I hope that you do um, as we unpack this. And you know, when you're rolling with the Holy Spirit, you know, it doesn't come, you know, it's not like going to class where you're taught by, you know, regular teachers. The Holy Spirit can just, you know, pour. And um, so I'm trying to receive, and hopefully I can deliver it, and we can all get something good out of it. But first, uh, before we begin, I want to pray and thank the Lord for this opportunity. Uh, the Bible says be ready to preach in season and out of season, and also acknowledge our dear beloved pastors and um, the entire team here. Those here, so grateful for you, and also those who are attending remotely. Thank you for joining us tonight. Heavenly Father, we come to you and I thank you uh, for your word. I thank you for this word. Thank you for giving it to me and I ask now, Holy Spirit, teach us. Use my lips and um, give me your word. And I ask, let it flow out. Father, we, this, we thank you for our pastors. We ask that you keep them safe and protected. And I just pray they have a joyous time. Whatever they're doing, I just pray that you surround them with divine favor in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I bless everyone here in attendance and those who are attending remotely. Uh, and I just thank you and I pray that your word reach deeply into each of our hearts that we may be transformed into the light of your dear son, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so... Um, I received and heard a message on redemption. It just really blessed me. And um, it's a bit loaded, and I think that we want to try to unpack it so we can get as much out of it as possible. Uh, it's, it just unfolds and unfolds. Um, and so what I want to try to do tonight is try to unpack as much of it as we go through the Scripture and I'm reminded of a point that my wife always makes. She says, Mark, the word is the point. You don't use the word to make your point. So we're going to make sure that we keep this focused on Jesus and focused on his word. Um, but again, we want to try to gain understanding. The Bible says, in all our getting, let us get understanding. So um, redemption, it's a powerful word. And I don't think it's one we should get too comfortable with. You know how you can hear something and you can get quite comfortable with it. So I want to dissect it a bit, and um, hopefully we can derive even more meaning as we unfold and unpack it a bit. Now, the concept here is we're going to try to personify and contextualize the word when I say personify, well, obviously we're going to talk not only about the Redeemer, who's the point of the matter, but also those of us who are being redeemed. Because when you say redemption, you know, we can be in a place where we're really more focused on us than we are on Jesus. But sometimes you need to juxtapose yourself when you're looking at Jesus, just to realize how good he is and how good he's been. So we want to personify it and contextualize it, because we need to understand sort of what this word meant biblically during those times, historically, and what it means today and for us as we move forward. Because there is a demand, there is an expectation on our lives. As the redeemed of the Lord, we're expected to say so. So the, the, the question is, do you know you're redeemed? And if you are redeemed, can you explain it? Some of us can say, well, I can explain it. Just let me get up here and start shouting. Because it should affect you in the deepest core of your being when you really realize what redemption and what God has done for us. So we're going to try to get there. Um, as we contextualize, we, we need to know who he is. And as we talk about my redeemer, it needs to be personal. It can't be the historical redeemer. It has to be your redeemer, my redeemer. 
He redeemed me. I'm glad and hopeful that he redeemed you, but it was necessary for him to redeem me. I needed him. I think one of the worst places we can be is in a place where you don't know you need him. There are a lot of people we can see today that are getting along in their minds just fine without Jesus. Then those of us, we don't know how we'll take another breath without Jesus. The Bible says sufficient for the day is its own trouble. It's not, someone doesn't necessarily have to teach me or tell me to, to spend time with the Lord. It's necessary. I can't make it without him. Um, th this, the Bible says that we have to be careful that we don't start heaping up teachers. There's some things that the Holy Spirit will give you when you love him. See, when you identify with your Redeemer, you fall in love with him. My wife has said to me many times, Mark, you can't teach somebody how to love God. But I think if we understand redemption, we can get a deeper appreciation of this love this love we have for our Lord. See, you can't sit still. There's something in you that wants to move. You want to celebrate him. You want to glorify him. You can't say, stay still too long. We have to be careful, of course, of those currents that would cause us to drift into the mundane, the, the normalcy of everyday life, the idolatry. My wife said, Mark, are you watching those sports again? I'm like, it's only one team. <laughs> those of us who know March Madness just passed. And, and, um, but in my spirit, I didn't say it, I knew there was a little pull there. And God says, I'm a jealous God. You try to justify it, but the truth is, there's all forms of idolatry. You can see folks idolizing themselves. They can be whoever they want to be in their mind. Even though biologically, biblically, it doesn't make sense, but you become your own idol. We have to be careful that we don't start drifting. That we keep our love walk tight. That we walk in him because we're grateful. We don't lose sight of him. We keep him focused. We keep him first. Not because someone tells us to. What do I need you to tell me to worship my God? I need you to tell me to worship him. Based on what he did for you or what he did for me. How far do I have to look back? Or can I go just today and celebrate him for what he did today? So this is a personal redemption. It's a personal walk. And we have to be careful that not only do we not slip into idolatry, that we can accept the freedom. Because how many of us want to be free? Now, it's interesting because, yes, you have to fight for your freedom. But how do you fight? See, this fight is a spiritual fight. Because when we start looking at redemption, there's some, there's some understanding that we need to get. The word redemption often comes up during the week of Passover. Let's move here. The Hebrew word means to buy back. The Greek word means deliverance, redemption, procured by the payment of a ransom. Paul was walking in slave markets at the time when he was describing this 
redemption that we need. See, we were all, we're going to see this in the scripture, we were all slaves to sin. What is a slave? A sl you have no rights as a slave. You have no authority. You have no dignity. Now, you may be a Fortune 500 CEO, but you can be a slave to sin. We're not talking about material. We're talking about spiritual. So as we dive into this, it's very important that we see this from a spiritual context. Because if we're not careful, we become natural. Who knows what carnality leads to? Death. But a spiritual life, spiritual mindedness is life and peace. So that means wherever we're walking, wherever we're going, whatever we do, we're reminded of our Redeemer, of our redemption, and we expect divine favor in our lives. We expect doors to open for us that may not open for the next person. There's an expectation on your life. God expects us, and there's certain things we expect from him. See, when you're redeemed and when you've been set free, you're not free from the law. God didn't tell us to go out here and break laws. I'm not saying you're a lawbreaker. That's idolatry. That means you get to do what you want to do. And God didn't call us to that. He says, no, we're supposed to observe those things. Pray for those in authority. And so when you're going through these things, we have to make sure that we recognize who we are in the spirit. And I know some of us may not get too many claps out of that. Okay? There's so much work to do in the spirit. So much work to do. So much work to do. So many times I've wondered if I just prayed a little bit more. If I spent a little more time with God. What I've heard, we can't get distracted, saints. We can't get distracted. It's so easy to, to slip into carnality. Whether it's watching too much basketball, or whether it's wanting to take up arms for a fight that God says is his. Now, by. So this word by how are you going to pay for something? What are you going to pay this ransom with? What could you have paid this ransom with? Could you have paid it? You didn't have what was necessary to make the payment, nor did I. We needed a redeemer. Why would I go back and get entangled in stuff that God hasn't called me to? Is living a born-again, redeemed life enough? I don't have a whole lot of time left to do things that are not of God. I don't have that kind of extra time or idle time. There's a lot you can spend your time. There's a lot left to do in the spirit. I believe in I'm going to live a long, prosperous life. But while I'm here, God expects something from me. You know I had, didn't have anything to give our God to set us free. The only offering that could be made was his. I can only imagine what God must have thought. And I thank God he saved me. He redeemed me. God's been good.
looking at us, no rights, no authority. That means if you see your own beloved, your own spouse, your own children bound, there's nothing you can do about it. Bound into slavery with a slave master who will do, do no matter, no telling what. I'm going to tell you, this is what the word says. It's not meant, if, if you're uncomfortable, it's the word. But it's something totally different when you realize you have authority. He's not only redeemed us, he's translated us in the, into the kingdom of his dear son. He didn't leave you powerless. He says, behold, I give you the authority to trample on scorp scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. How can we be dependent on a world system that can only offer you the immediate and never give you the ultimate. The Bible says, don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't throw your confidence away. There should be something in you that resonates. My Redeemer lives. Not only that, he's giving you the authority. We see when Jesus... When Jesus was resurrected from the dead and he walked this earth, there are no recorded miracles or healing. But we know is that God had already given the church that authority. And he tells us to do one thing before we begin this. Wait. Wait on the Holy Spirit till you receive power from on high. Now that you've got that power and you've got that authority, what do you do with it? My sister said she was exercising hers today. The Bible says he expects us to lay hands on the sick, to raise the dead. Let's keep our priorities straight because if we can look around, there's a whole lot of work to do. The Bible says the harvest is plenty. But the laborers are few. How many of us think we're laboring, but there's no evidence of it? Presently, there's all types of bondage. You don't have to look far. You can just watch the commercials. How many of you fast forward between commercials? and It's um, all forms of bondage. There's a need. For redemption. <clears throat> you have to bear with me with the slides here. Excellent. <clears throat> Romans 6, 17, 18. But God be thanked that through, though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, doctrine to which you were delivered. And have been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. If you've been set free from slavery, why would you sign up to be another slave? See, one was involuntary. The other one was voluntary. The, the, the one that was voluntary was the one that said, this is the least I can do for the one who set me free. I can remember when we went through a mighty trial, my wife and I, and my son had been attacked. I had trained at some of the best institutions in the country. There was nothing we could do for him.
There was nothing that colleagues could do for him but God. I was one of those who I would listen to my gospel music to work, and then the way back I would listen to secular music. Because I needed him going to work, but on the way home I guess I didn't need him as much. I'm just being transparent with you. But I remember coming out of that situation And my son had been so ill he couldn't attend school. And my wife was spending his time bandaging him. And we decided to let him go back to school. The Lord had, was moving supernaturally. None of what we were doing made sense to the doctors. In fact, I was threatened, you know, that we're going to send you to, I don't know, whoever the folks are that challenge your license. I reminded her that we went to medical school together. And, and um, I'm a doctor, too. It didn't matter. They didn't agree with what we were doing or believing for. We didn't know a whole lot at that time. But God was showing up. And then finally, as we moved through the process, it became clear that God was in it and we needed to get to know him personally. See, I believe we had made him our savior, but I don't know that we knew a whole, about, a whole lot about making him our Lord. This pastor said many times, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. But I remember coming out of that situation and my son had to get up an hour, hour and a half just so my wife could pack his wound. He was only in the he was young, 12, 13, fifth grade, and I think 12. And I remember driving him to school on 64. We lived in Suffolk. We drove him all the way down to Norfolk and off Little Creek Road. And, and um, to a Christian school there. And I remember the Lord, as we had stopped on the highway, the Lord, in my mind, my son was asleep because he was getting up early just to make it to school. He was barely moving. He hadn't got all of his strength back. But I we wanted him to finish the, the school year. We had received some news from some providers at a major institution that said, look, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. That was enough to get the folks here off my back, off our back. And I remember driving him to school, and we, the traffic had almost stopped, and I remember thinking, I don't know why this just went through my head, how many people would I give my life for? It was just a thought. And at that time, my list was extremely, extremely short. But nobody was listening, it was just me. My son was asleep. And the Holy Spirit showed up in the car and said, I heard who you give your life for. And I didn't feel condemned, it wasn't condemnation. It wasn't judging. He just asked the question. He said, look at your son. And I thought, my first thought was, I'm driving, even though the traffic had stopped. And it wasn't a casual thing. It was a very, it was still very reverent because you're trying to make sense of what's going on. Because again, I wasn't as personal with God at the time. But I remember he said, look, look at your son. And I did after, you know, a minute or seconds. And and I, I remember him asking me, he said, I heard who you give your life for, but who would you give his life for? And I remember immediately tears coming in my eyes and saying, no one, Lord. Feeling somewhat ashamed, like, I don't know what the right answer is, Lord, but nobody. And he said, because that's what I did for you. See, salvation, redemption is free, but it costs something. And we're obliged to remember it. It was the blood. Sozo, 
deliver or protect, heal, preserve, save, do well, be made whole. Christ died so we'd have all of that. But it's important that as we start hearing these definitions, as we start reading this word, that we don't forget to personify it. It was Jesus. It was the Lord on that cross. The Bible says in Romans 8, 32, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? We were working through something recently. My wife asked me the question, do you have have faith for it? It was a very simple question. And part of me would be like, what kind of question is that? And I realized I'd been spending more time trying to work it out of the natural and less time applying my faith to it, believing for it, the part that pleases God for it. See, that part stills necessary. I don't care how much you got in the bank. I don't care how healed and whole, you know, how well you feel. You still need the Lord. I'm not telling you what to do, but I do know how to go get it. Because sometimes you got to go get it. You got to take what's yours. This is a covenant right. Because when you've been in bondage and you've been a slave to this world system, you can get remnants on you. You can carry a burden that you're not supposed to be carrying. You can feel like you don't measure up. God bless you. You can feel like you're still the tail and not the head. And you say, well, that's going to take some time. Well, there's there's an issue with that because it can cost you something. You need to know who you are. Your identity is at stake. You need to be able to move in your authority. You can't do that as the tail. It doesn't mean you can't sit in the back and wait for God to call you up. It just means you know who you are. Whether you're sitting in the back, the front, the side, it doesn't matter. I'm a king's kid. I'm anointed. I'm blessed. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm a world overcomer because I'm born of God. I'm a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new to me. This is, this is what your spirit man is saying all day. When is your soul going to wrap its head around it? The enemy shouldn't be comfortable in our presence. The Bible says don't have fellowship with demons. Why would the Bible tell us not to do it if we aren't capable of doing it? See, we're not talking about things just in the world. We're talking about things that can happen in the church. Men and women being taken captive into all forms of bondage. Things that you don't see in the daylight or daylight. But God said it's going to come to the light. Now, we're not talking about anybody. I preached to myself before I preached to anybody else. But when you remember how awesome and mighty your Redeemer is, and that you had, there was a a penalty, there was a debt on your life that you had nothing to offer to pay for. Silver and gold wouldn't do it. The best mom and daddy couldn't do it. Only the blood. For we know that 
the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. We're talking about spiritual matters. We're called to a higher purpose. We've been called, we've been called to be seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, our Lord. You can't operate down here effectively until you can operate up there effectively. You can't operate up there effectively until you know who you are. One author put it this way. David's faith, his great faith, was necessary to to win that battle with Goliath. But it took identity for him to take the throne. God expects us to know our identity. You're worth it. Man came to me today and I apologize for running late. And as we, as I cared for him, and we're working through some things, I just felt in my spirit, just tell him he's worth it. He's worth it. You're worth it. It's okay to prioritize you your health, you're worth it. And I believe the man, I don't know what his faith was at the time. I didn't ask him. I sewed it into him. One of our cards. And, but I believe that he needed to know that. You're worth it. How would one measure your worth? It's too easy to to try to measure our worth in carnal ways. But God doesn't look at us the way man looks at us. Our worth is measured on a much higher plane. It was the cost of sinless, spotless blood. of God's one and only son. And he says, in whom I am well pleased, and as he told Peter, James, and John, listen to him. Romans 6, 16, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Colossians 1, 13 says, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. The New Living Version says, God took us out of a life of darkness He has put us in the holy nation of his much-loved son. Mm. Man, that was good. He has put us in the holy nation. Holy means set apart. That's you. We've been set apart. just like his much-loved son. We have much to be thankful for. And when you realize a loved person, a grateful person, in my mind is an unstoppable person. We don't want to forget how important being grateful is. Jesus says, Those who are forgiven much, they love much. Mm. 
But if you think you got it all together, you only need a little bit of forgiveness. This is the Bible. This is the word. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is the truth. I am free. I am free. I'm not free to commit crimes. I am free. I am free. You are free. The Bible says, don't throw your confidence away. Your freedom came at a price. That's what redemption is. But beyond the definition of redemption, behind it is a person who saw us bound, unable to be set free apart from him, apart from himself. From himself. And there's a freedom in Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Which law are we functioning in? I think we have to be careful. The law of the spirit of life, I don't think it's at exclusion. I think you can slip. We have to maintain the course. We have to continue to look to the hills from which our help comes. We have to continue to focus and face the Lord. We have to continue to focus and face his direction. We don't have another redeemer. There's no backup plan. There's no plan B. Now he says you can fall. A righteous man can fall seven times, but he gets back up. We're not talking about condemnation. He says, no, you're not condemned. That was paid for too. You can get back up. Because you didn't get up in the first place on your own. Nor the second place, the third place, the fourth place. Because sometimes, you know, we can be so removed from what it used to be like that we can sort of forget really how good God has been. My wife asked me, Mark, do you have faith for it? And it was very humbling because I was like, huh, right, right, hmm. Bond servant of Christ. Titus 1 says, Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. James 1.1, 1, 1, James, a bond servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Titus referred to himself as a bondservant. James referred to himself as a bondservant. Peter calls himself a bondservant. Not a bondservant to a job, to a career. A diplomat, I'm a bondservant of Christ. One thing you know, 
your favorite CEO or your favorite employee or your favorite professor or your favorite teacher would not and could not pay your ransom. Identity is so important to live a fruitful life. You can't bear fruit with your head down. This takes confidence. If you're going to tell a devil to come out, you have to be confident. You need authority. As the seven sons of Sceva realized when the demoniac, the demon-possessed man said, Paul I know, Jesus I know, but who are you? Some folks are like, oh, I, I, don't, I don't play with that. Well, you probably shouldn't. But the point is, you have authority in his name. That word authority is exousia. It's from the Greek. It means, it means authority, delegated authority. Over power, dunamis. There's so many words for power. He says, I'm giving you authority over all the power of the enemy. Not that the enemy doesn't have power. We know the enemy has power. But God says, I'm giving you authority over it. Not to wrestle with it. No, you just speak to it. See, we're not who we used to be anymore. You're not a slave anymore. You're not entitled to what the devil has to give. Things start getting low. Funds start getting low. It's time to sow. Somebody should keep that. We learned that. Because the enemy is trying to back you into a corner. What you going to do now? I'm going to sow into the kingdom. I may have multiple resources, but I only have one source. And he's able to make all grace abound towards me. I don't know where it's coming, but I expect it. I know him well enough to expect it. Praise God. Romans 6, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. So between then and, and everlasting, God is saying there should be some fruit coming out of you. So when you get planted and rooted and grounded in Christ and who he is, something should come up out of you. Something good should come up out of you. Who knows fruit's good? Fruit is good. Stand fast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 13, 16, 13 says, Watch, stand face, fast in the faith, be strong, be brave, be brave, be strong. Now, we're not talking carnality here. We're not talking about lifting weights. Bodily exercise profits little. We're not discarding that. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about flexing physical muscles. We're talking about flexing faith muscles. God says faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. See, the love I have for my God motivates me. When Peter said, do you want us to call down fire and, and just like Elisha? And Jesus says, you don't know what spirit you've been born of. That's not how we work. There's plenty of work to do. But we can't afford a carnal work. That's not what we're called to. 
Philippians 1.27 says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. In other words, what your conduct should look like is a testimony. Your conduct should look like someone who was bought and set free and grateful enough to acknowledge it. Pastor Timmy said, your walk talks louder than your talk talk. Somebody should know you've been saved. Somebody should know you've been redeemed. Because see, if you don't know you need a redeemer, if you don't know what redemption is, some might think you got it on your own. Knowing you couldn't have paid for it. Your works are like filthy rags to God. All them good ones. We're not talking about the bad ones, we're talking about the good ones. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs. That you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. See, we're locked in love. We love the same God. We come here and we tune in because we worship the same God. We love the same God. We love Jesus. Jesus is wonderful. He's wonderful. Altogether, wonderful. Every part of his being, everything about him is wonderful. He's that good. See, this is a love walk. See, a man who loves God is much more intimidated than a madman. To me, human You can say woman, but a person. Loving God is the ultimate. But what are you loving him for? See, redemption speaks not only the person, the redeemer, but the one being redeemed. See, that's my part, to acknowledge and remember him. The Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear heard the things which God has prepared for those who love him. The world is full of the people that love God, I mean that God loves. But heaven is full of people that love him. We love God. Philippians 4.1 says, therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. You are so loved. You are so loved. You have every right, every kingdom right to that which is good from God. He spares no good gift. None. Can you play one of my favorite songs as we prepare the altar? For anyone who wants to see prayer, if any of our ministers are here, But if there's someone either watching or here who doesn't know the Redeemer, because there's no other Redeemer. There's only one Redeemer. If there's anyone here who wants to know the Redeemer, come forth so we can pray for you and bless you. As we prepare to leave, Can you please play that wonderful song, if you have it? Because God is so good. You know, we don't have to live in the past. But God is good. Mm. He's just that good. And you are his beloved. I love you. I love you. You guys are some beautiful, beautiful saints. Beautiful. Beautiful. As we bless you, let that continue to play as we head out of here. For those who are tuning in and if you're hearing this message, God bless you. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you can accept him. You can say, Jesus, 
I'm a sinner. Redeem me. Save me. Come into my heart. Live in me. I believe you died for my sins and you were raised from the dead. And I acknowledge you now as my Lord and Savior. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus asked Peter one question. One question. He said, go tell Peter. Go get Peter. He had this question for Peter. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love him? My wife says, you can't teach somebody how to love God, but do you love him? He's worthy. He's worthy to be loved. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you for delivering the message. I thank you. And Father, I bless your people as they head out. Thank you, Father, for their sacrifice coming out tonight. For those tuning in, we bless them, Lord. Yes, Lord, with abundance and favor. Yes, Lord, we pray for our pastors. Bless them. And to you alone be all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you all. To God be the glory.